Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this Hola a todos. Es un placer event. Darles la bienvenida uh, a I este forgot evento. to disconnect from the interpretation. <laughs> Listening to the wonderful voice of our de Spanish interpreter. De la interpretación. Una increíble voz la que tenía la intérprete. Let's see if, if now I'm listening to myself. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, the purpose of this meeting today is to speak about psycho-emotional self-care during a disaster response. I was invited by my good friend, Musha, who is being one of the interpreters who's working for the first responders after the earthquake in Istanbul. And, well, it, it was not Istanbul, right? It, it, it was the birther town between Syria and, and Turkey. And um, so the scale of the event is so enormous. It's 10 times what we have had here in Mexico in our worst earthquakes, because we are not foreigners, so that's our tragedy. So uh, when she said, could you speak about self-care and mental care during a disaster response, I was more than happy to say yes, because it's a subject that needs to be discussed. And we, as interpreters, we have to be aware of what to do to help ourselves in case of vicarious trauma. So that's the reason why we're here. Some logistic announcements before we begin. We are having four Spanish English interpreters who are here to do some deliberate practice of their simultaneous interpreting skills. We also have um, a sign language, Mexican sign language interpreter, Noe Romero, who's also doing deliberate practice. So you can perhaps pin him if you want to see his work. He's an amazing interpreter. And uh, well, that's that's all I have to say about giving credits to the interpreters who will be helping us today. Yes, a round, a big round of applause <laughs> to all of them. The recording will be available on the YouTube channel for those of you who um, perhaps have to leave after a while, or if people were not able to come in from the very beginning, the recording will be here for everyone. And so. Without any further ado, let us get started into our conversation today. Let's I'll start sharing my screen. And here it is. So the title of this presentation is Psycho-Emotional Self-Care During a Disaster Response. And so I always like to begin my talks by doing an exercise before we hear the theory. And later, when you hear what this was about, you go, ah, oh, that's how I feel. That's why I felt this way, or that's why this came up. Eh, this is something that I usually like to do. So let us get started with that. I am going to ask you, especially the first responders on the call, to very briefly think about the event you're going through. And in a scale from zero to 10, how strong do you feel the emotional state that you're going through because of this? If, if it's painful, in a scale from zero to 10, how painful, how much do you feel that? All right, so what we're going to do is, please look at me now. <laughs> we're going to do a tapping exercise from something that is called thought field therapy. So we're going to start tapping on the right side, well, if you're tapping with your left side, on the left side of your hand, like this, in something that is called a karate chop. So you're going to repeat after me, even though the situation is being difficult, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. We're going to do it three times, second time. Even though what I'm going through, it's difficult, letting someone in, <laughs> I deeply and completely love and accept myself. That was the second time. Let's do the third time. Even though this situation is extremely overwhelming, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Now we're going to use two fingers to tap here in the beginning of your eyebrow. You're gonna do some tapping below your eye. You're going to do some tapping below your arm like this. Now we're going to go to the clavicle point. You, you will find the where your clavicles meet. You go down and two inches to the right, and that's where you tap. 
And now we're going to do something that's called the gamut point, which is in this part of the hand, you're going to do tapping like this. So open your eyes really wide and close them. Open them again. Bring your eyes down to the left. Bring your eyes down to the right. We are going to do a clockwise motion with our eyes starting with 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And now we're going to move our eyes in a counterclockwise circular movement. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You're going to hum with me the beginning of the happy birthday song. <laughs> Count with me. One, two, three, four, five. We hum again. <laughs> we go back to the eyebrow. We go back below the eye. We tap below the armpit once again. We tap on the clavicle. And stop. Now, gauge yourself again in a scale from zero to 10. How much intense do you feel this painful emotion with you? Has it decreased? Yes, somebody's saying yes on, on, on the camera. Good. <laughs> Well, this is just a little exercise for us to see that there are ways in which we can process our emotions uh, because many people will tell you, don't feel like that. Come on, get over it. Yeah, that's easy to say, but how do you do it? There are different techniques in which you can help your emotions be processed and so that they can leave the message that they're bringing and they can be transformed into something else. During this talk, we're going to work with several of them. This one comes from acupressure. Uh, Chinese acupuncture uh, techniques that use the meridian systems. And everything that will be presented uh, presenting here is highly influenced by Eastern philosophy, but it has been tested by Western medicine as well, so that um, you get the best of both worlds, so to say. So this was called emotional freedom technique or a thought field therapy tapping exercise. I am going to be giving you links to everything we do because... Um, Maybe you will find that some of the exercises you resonate with them, some of them, they don't seem to do much for you. That's okay. That's why we're giving you options so that you can work with your body to process the emotions that you might be feeling in, in this um, situation you're going through. Okay, so that was the first one. Now I'll go back to my presentation. And um, we're going to... Mm -hmm. And um, I thought I needed to let somebody on the call. No, we're, we're good. Okay, so another exercise that we will be doing is the following. We're going to be using a technique that's called Genshin Yuitsu before we start with the theory. Once again, Genshin Yuitsu, it's a Japanese technique which also works with a meridian system. And just as with reflexology, when you stimulate different points that are in the feet and you can get benefits, you can also do this using your hands. And not only do they help your body, bodily systems, but they also help the psychological manifestation of whatever is happening inside your body. So the first exercise, we're going to be just holding our fingers like this. And every time we hear the bell chime, we're going to switch to the next finger. And this is a way in which you will be listening to me. And at the same time, you will Could you be please repeat? Could you please show it again? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. It, 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 the first position goes like this. You just need to hold your thumb. When we hear the bell chime, we will go to the next finger. When we hear the, the bell ring, we go to the next. And each time we hold one of the fingers, we are stimulating a different uh, body system. And this is a way in which emotions are also processed. This system is called Jinshin Yuitsu. It's a Japanese technique that is also helping us process 
our emotions, especially those that are coming from trauma. Okay, so and this is also done so that I make certain that you are not using your mobiles while you listen to me <laughs> because your hands are busy. The interpreters can also hold their fingers. The only person here who won't be holding fingers is Noe because he has to do sign language interpretation. <laughs> but the rest of us, we start holding our thumb like this, okay? And um, when we hold our thumbs, we are working with our stomach and spleen, and we are helping the body process worry, excessive worry, okay? So here we begin. Okay, so that's the instruction for while you listen to me. Now let's start with the theory. Being part of a team that is doing first response in the case of an emergency is something that even though it's a highly rewarding experience because you are there for people at a time of dire need, it, it can also be very challenging because you are very close to human suffering, uh, a tragedy. You are also at the risk of personal harm. It, it, the workloads can be very intense and also, in the case of many of you who have traveled from Istanbul to these sites, well, you're separated from your family, so this is also an additional stress to uh, what you are dealing with. So the risk that you are now facing is, first of all, burnout. Burnout, which is the, um, a step before there is actual manifestation of vicarious or secondary trauma. Burnout can be experienced through different symptoms, such as sadness, depression, or apathy. Uh, there might be irritability. You might be, be easily frustrated. There could also be a sense of blaming others for things, but it's just because you are in overload. Your, your bodily system is being overloaded by demands, and there's so much the body can do. So the, all of these responses are natural and perhaps to be expected. Uh, you could also feel numb, as if you, you were indifferent or detached in a state that is called dissociation. You could also be perhaps um, feeling tired, exhausted, or overwhelmed. And there could be certain mental ruminations, such as, uh, I feel like a failure, nothing we do will help. Uh, why is this happening to us? We're not doing the work well. Or there could be a certain... Uh, need to use alcohol or other drugs to cope with the situation. All of this is just a sign of burnout. And as you can see, oh, now we move to the next finger, the, your index finger. And when you hold the index finger, you're working with your kidney and your bladder. And this is helping you process fear. So keep your hand like this. So as I was telling you, burnout is something that if you see the list of symptoms, this seems to be very frequent. It's more common than, what do you mean burnout? This is my daily state. <laughs> well, that's because, you know, um, trauma is something that is commutative and we don't even notice how much trauma we're getting, carrying in our bodies and our systems and our tissues uh, until we pay attention to what's going on inside of ourselves. So all of that was only burnout. Once burnout has been surpassed, we do start seeing the signs of secondary traumatic stress or, or trauma. And this can be manifested in mental rumination that's even more intense. There's an excessive fear or worry that something bad could happen again. Uh, you could be easily startled or on guard all of the time. There might be physical signs of, of stress, such as a racing heart. There might be nightmares or feeling that the trauma of others is your own. There might be a certain tendency to isolate yourself, to protect yourself from all of the um, drama around you. Uh, there, the substance abuse could be increasing and there could also be a very dangerous component of trauma, which is self-blame. Uh, actually, uh, all mental diseases have at its heart self-blame. So this is a symptom that you have to be very aware of, and, and we are going to do an intervention to help reduce the self-blame or the self-criticism. Perfectionism is also another word for it. And we interpreters, we tend to be very perfectionistic. <laughs> oh, why didn't I do this? But I, it could have been better. You know what I'm talking about, right? We go to the middle finger. In By uh, holding the middle finger like this, we're working with the liver and the gallbladder. And the emotion that is being aided by this movement is 
anger. So every time you get angry, you know why you have to hold that finger, <laughs> that middle finger. There is a connection there. So holding the, the middle finger, we continue with the uh, presentation. So as I was telling you, um, your issues live in your tissues. If you consider how trauma is expressed in the body, when you are facing a traumatic situation, and trauma is something that it can be a physical event that is threatening you, but it is also an emotional threat. There are two reasons for this. One of them is that they share the same neurological connections inside the brain. So if you are receiving a beating, your brain is processing it as if you know you got into a fight with your best friend. There's no difference for the brain where the origin or how serious the injury could be from trauma. The brain process them equally. And it, it is also something that is evolutionary. If you consider how we were able to survive as a race because we got together to protect one another. So if somebody got into a fight with somebody from the tribe and was kicked out of the tribe, they risked not being able to survive alone in the wilderness. So that is why we feel that when we have relational issues that our life is in danger, even though it is not, getting into a fight with your bull, with your significant other is not going to kill you. However, your body is experiencing as if it could. And that is something that is evolutionary. So um, what we need to consider is how trauma Sorry, we'll go to the next point. We are holding now the fourth finger, the ring finger. And by doing this, we're working with the lung and the large intestine. And the emotion that is being processed by holding it like this is sadness, the ring finger. And speaking about how trauma is and or how it enters the body, when you are facing a situation that could be considered a risk for your body, the first thing that is affected is the liver because the liver is requested to produce ATP so that you have energy to protect yourself. So this is the first, when, when you get like a pinch in the right side part of your abdomen, that is the first manifestation of trauma during the body. The second manifestation is through uh, your heartbeat because the heart knows that it needs to produce or, or send blood out more quickly because you need to be ready to respond to an emergency to fight or to uh, run away. So that is the second thing that is affected. After the heart, then the digestive system shut down completely because uh, energy is needed somewhere else. Peristalsis, which is the movement of the bowels is completely stopped. So that's why some people right now might be experiencing some stomach issues, constipation or diarrhea, or that they eat anything and it's, you know, it's not feeding them well. It's not feeding them well. Well, that's also because peristalsis is affected by trauma. The next part of the system that is affected is the lungs because uh, your diaphragm kind of, uh, when the digestive system shuts down, it's kind of stuck. It doesn't let the, the lungs move so easily. So the next system that is affected is lungs, the lungs. And finally, the kidney. Once the kidneys are affected, it means that the trauma is affecting the whole body. And how is this perceived in symptoms? Now we go to the pinky finger, hold your pinky finger like this. And what we're helping by doing this is the heart, we're helping the heart as well as the small intestine. Now that was explaining how it goes system by system. That's how we're also working system by system with the holding of our fingers. Hello. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Could you repeat the first one? What? Uh, the, the, the first? And the second. No, and the second, the, please. No, not the fingers, but the symptoms you were talking the about. Symptoms. The first one. Yeah. The, the, where it enters the system. It, it's the first, it goes liver, then it goes to the heart. The, the, you, is, is that your question? No, you said something like that you feel something like a pinch in your um the right side abdomen, of your body something like that yeah could, could you repeat that yeah it, it's when the liver when the liver has been affected the, the mm. liver is the first organ where trauma hits the body because energy is required and that the, the liver is our storage of energy that is why was that the question 
Yes, and somebody asked the second one as well, if you could repeat the second one. Yes, it's, it's the liver, and then it goes to the heart because more blood is needed for the body to defend itself. Then it goes to the digestive tract, the stomach and the bowels, the peristalsis is stopped. Then it goes, uh, once the diaphragm is affected because the, the digestive system is not moving, it affects the lungs, your breathing capacity. And the final system that is affected is your uh, kidney system. So that, that is kind of the path. And people experience symptoms differently according to their own history. Because remember that I told you that trauma is cumulative. And so trauma starts to accumulate since we're little children. For instance, if it, it, this all starts with how we relate to our caregivers. If caregivers are sensitive to the needs of a child, now we go to the other hand, you're going to start grabbing the thumb of the opposite hand, and we're going to be working the same as we did with the first hand. Uh, this, once again, is worry. We're working with worry. So children are taught by their caregivers uh, how to relate to the world. If your caregivers were sensitive to your needs, and if you cried, they came and fed you or changed the diaper, and they were, you know, didn't make a fuss out of that, then your unconscious mind and your um, nervous system learn to believe that there's goodness in the world. Then yes, things can get rough, they can be uncomfortable, but that's okay because, you know, you, you cry a little, you ask for help, they come give it to you so you can expect life to be a good place to live in. But if there was neglect, if there was a, an attention that was not constant, or if there was erratic care or aggressiveness or violence, then the nervous system, the unconscious mind, gets the idea that the uh, world is a dangerous place. And therefore, you have to be on the lookout for danger all of the time. This is something that is manifested in your body as well as in your brain. I'll explain what is the difference between the two of them. Uh, so uh, trauma it can be uh, notice in the body when there is an, um, a lot of mood swings, when there are intrusive thoughts. Remember what I told you about rumination, that you go on and go on about the bad things that have happened or could happen or are happening nonstop. Um, there might be, on the other hand, instead of the intrusions, avoidance, or they can go um, first one and then the other and go back to the first symptom. And there might be certain impairment in how to take care of yourself for daily activities the, the, uh, and, and many other symptoms because trauma is stored in the body. Remember how I explained the next finger, the index finger? Remember that I explained that trauma is cumulative. Every time it, it, the, the system is attacked in a way and it has to defend itself, the emotions are stuck inside the organs and the cells. And this starts alterating something that is called the fascia. Fascia is a lining that covers all of our organs. And not only does it cover the organs, but it goes through the organs and it provides support for your body. For instance, the fact that you can stand up straight has to do with you have a, a bone system, you, but it, it's also because of the fascia. Fascia provides you with a sense of stability and structure. The fascia, if you were attacked by somebody, if I was going to punch you right now, the fascia of your body will become very, very tight so that you don't feel the impact of the punch that I could give you. But the problem with fascia is that they don't go back to their original form that easily. So after a lot of stress, chronic stress or severe trauma, fascia is strained. It changes its shape. It doesn't go back to its original form. And so even though you want to feel okay and happy and optimistic, if your fascia has made your body look like this, yes, I want to feel very happy because the world is good and life is beautiful. You can't because your body is in no position to so that you can feel better about whatever is happening. And the fascia system is affecting there are six fascia systems, but the three ones that are affected by trauma is the inhalation and exhalation fascia, the uh, extension fascia, and the flexion fascia. So that's why people who have suffered a lot of trauma look like this. And so this type of trauma requires physical therapy, and it requires you do something with your body so that you can help your body, your fascia realign. And so we were. 
we, with the second finger, right? We go to the third, anger. And so how do you help your fascia go back to its original shape so that you can help all of the emotions that are stuck in your body liberate themselves and so that you can help your fascia go back to the original shape? Um, the best thing you can do, I mean, there are many different uh, body therapies, uh, Feldenkrais, somatotherapy, body work. But there's also a type of yoga that is called yin yoga, which specializes in the fascia. I'm going to give you a link of uh, one of my favorite YouTubers who do yin yoga. I forgot, sorry, I forgot to leave uh, the link for uh, the, the finger exercises. Let's see. I don't remember how to, I need to stop sharing, right? To use the chat. I'm just leaving this. This is for so that you have uh, the information about Jinxin. And now I'm going to share the link of uh, the, the Yin Yoga YouTubers that I like that do wonderful work with uh, trauma. It's the channel is called Yogi Moksha. Those guys, they're Australian yogis. Let's see if I, I can share a little bit of what they do. Let's see if this works. Hello, you're with Vanessa and Can you Andrew see it and from Yogi Moksha. Thanks so much for joining this practice today. Let me is... see. So this is how Yin works. You use a lot of props like bolsters or blocks or um, belts. And so you go into a position and you stay in that position for around three to five to seven minutes because working with muscle and working with fascia are two very different stories. We go to the next finger which is working sadness, the lung once again. So in yin yoga, you use the props so that you get in the position and then you stay there for a while without moving. And this is how fascia require the action of gravity and time to, be, um, to become flexible once again, to go back to the original position. For instance, in this exercise, he has a bolster here at his back and he's opening his chest. So he's helping the heart and the lungs. Remember that I told you that they get uh, uh, affected by trauma or for instance here, let's go. They are working with the digestive system because those positions, they are working with the stomach and spleen meridians, for instance. So I leave you with this resource if, if you have never practiced yoga, the good thing about yin, it's a very gentle type of yoga. Everybody can do it. It, it really poses no risk. It, it In the beginning, you might feel very tight because you've never flexed your body like this or for so long, but it's truly beneficial. For instance, in, in this exercise, what they're doing is they're working with the lateral part of the, uh, the body so that you can regain flexibility in that area. So, well, just a very brief pick on what yin yoga can do for you. Let me go back to my presentation. Any questions so far? Because I, perhaps I'm moving too quickly. So far, so good. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> so th that is the, um, when we speak about how to work with trauma in the body, those are the physical interventions you can do to help with trauma in, in your body. But uh, it, it also affects your neurological connections. And that is a different type of work. We go to the other finger. I believe that's the pinky finger. And the pinker is working the heart and all of the, um, uh, the tiredness. It helps with people who have, you know, try really hard to do things and are exhausted. This is a way in which you can help your body through that. So speaking about what to do with the neurological connections, and this is my field of expertise because the rest of the things, well, yeah, I'm a body psychotherapist and um, I do work with the body when patients come in, but my specialty is hypnosis. <laughs> How does this work in the body? Well, every time you have an experience, your mind is going to create a neurological connection. For instance, every time you drive from home to the office, you take a certain path. And you've taken that path hundreds of times. So that means that your body has created a neurological connection so that it's easier for you. I see that people are yawning. That's a good sign that the, the exercise is working. <laughs> so uh, 
I'm seeing what you're doing, right? <laughs> so, uh, and once a neurological connection is created, it's myelinated, myelinizada in Spanish for my interpreters. It, it means that it's covered by fat, a, a, a fatty substance. And so that means that you will do that action very, very quickly because the neurological connection is set and it's been myelinated. Unfortunately, this can work in your benefit or it can go work against you. If you have had many painful experiences and you, uh, your fight or flight system is overactive because you believe that there's more danger in the world than there actually is, it's because your neurological connections have been deformed. They have been taught to believe that things are worse than they actually are. So this is where trauma really messes our lives because the brain, because it's gone through so much. And I, with this, we conclude with the Jinjin Jin Jin Shui Tzu exercise. I hope you feel a little bit better just by holding your fingers. <laughs> and so as I was telling you, um, the problem with neurological connections is that um, they make you see the world through the lens of fear when you have experienced too much trauma in the past. And so you are expecting bad things to happen when they don't necessarily have to happen, but your perspective of the world has been affected by so much trauma that's stored in the body and that has changed your neurological connections. And that has made your amygdala, which is a part of the brain that is always scanning the environment for danger. And if the amygdala notices that there's something that, um, is dangerous, it activates the system that I spoke of, the liver, the heart, et cetera, et cetera. So what do we do to help the brain, especially the amygdala, the one that throws us into fight or flight, how do we make them relax? <laughs> and, and so that they can read the environment in a more realistic way. Well, for that, I need to make an explanation about the difference between implicit and explicit memories. An explicit memory is one that you can evoke by using your words. It's the left side of the brain working. In psychology, we call this the three L's, everything that is logical, everything that is linguistic, everything that is lineal, the LLL. Those are when you can produce a memory by your speech, that is an explicit memory because you can explain it. But trauma doesn't go out of the body by explicit memories. It has to be worked through implicit memories. Implicit memories are the ones that are kept in our bodies. The ones that um, you, you have no actual worthy recollection of them, but that all of a sudden you start feeling a lot of anxiety and you don't even know why, what's going on. Something triggered that implicit memory that, that you, it's out of your consciousness. This is what's difficult about trauma. So what do we, how do we work with that, with the implicit memories? And for that, we can use our imagination. The good thing about the imagination is that now that we have brain scans and all of those sophisticated technologies, we have validated something that shamans have done for thousands of years, which is to use the imagination to bring the implicit memories into a safe space where you can add more resources there and they can be healed and transformed so that they are no longer painful, so that they are no longer triggering. And all of this can be done through the use of your imagination. That's how powerful the imagination is. And actually studies have been made with uh, high performance athletes in which uh, brain scans are done on them when they are practicing their sport or where they're when they are only imagining that they're doing it and the brain activity is exactly the same imagining something becomes a mandate to your physiology and this is something that is also easily attested by for instance i guess all of you here have watched a horror movie in the past right you know horror movies are fake those things don't happen in real life uh, maybe the um the, the storyline is absurd, it's preposterous. Um, but anyway, if you're caught in the storyline and somebody comes from behind and touches your shoulder, it's going to give you a heart attack. Like, right? You scared me. Why does that happen? You know, the movie is fake. You know, those things don't happen in real life. However, your body was living them as if they were real. That's how powerful the imagination is to bring us into different bodily states that can affect our well-being. So we're always using our imagination to 
get ourselves into different types of trances. This is something that is part of the human experience. Why don't we use our imagination to promote positive trances instead of the negative ones that are going to affect us and make our lives miserable? And remember that after several traumatic experiences that have affected your fascia, your neurological connections, your body, it's almost natural that your imagination runs wild with uh, fatalistic scenarios. So we need to retrain the mind to also use imagination for other types of purposes. So far, so good. Are there any questions? I know I've given you a ton of theory, <laughs> but um, when we speak about trauma, it is important to see it from all perspectives, the body, the mind, um, the past history, that how it, it, it affects our perspective. Why is it that there are some experiences that affect us more than others? Well, it depends on our personal history and the, the things that we have gone through and how we came to conclusions about the world. So you have to bring everything, the mind and the body, when you work with trauma. Mm, okay, somebody was saying bye-bye uh, on the chat. Good. So any questions? Can we go into the final exercise now? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Okay, so I'll share my screen. This is going to be a little guided meditation that has a mindfulness exercise to help you process emotions. It's called the RAIN method. R A I N, RAIN, like the RAIN. R for recognizing, A for allowing, I for investigating, and N for nurturing. And this is something that if you only remember one thing from this talk, remember rain. <laughs> this is truly a life saver, especially uh, under the circumstances that you're going through. So this exercise that I'll run has rain, has a little pranayama, pranayama, which is breathing exercises. Breathing is a very important part of how you deal with trauma because breathing has this um, feature that it can be controlled consciously or unconsciously but when you control your breathing consciously especially when you prolong your exhalations you are activating your parasympathetic nervous system the parasympathetic nervous system is the one that helps you with rest and digest functions and in our daily lives parasympathetic systems they suffer a great deal because it has to do with evolution there are six ways in which we can activate the sympathetic which is the one that brings you to action, secreting adrenaline and cortisol and all of the things that make you move in the world. But there are only three paths to activate the parasympathetic. And ever since um, technology changed the world, for instance, the fact that you can stay at night at 3 a.m. in the morning translating when there's no light, uh, that is affecting your parasympathetic system. Uh, the substances that we use to keep us going, coffee or other drugs, they affect the parasympathetic nervous system. So that is why it's so difficult for people to relax because our modern lifestyles have gotten away from natural cycles, that circadian cycles, as we call them. And um, the constant notifications that get through the mobile are keeping us always on alert. And actually the design of social media is such that you get dopamine hits constantly. That's why they are addictive because their design is for you to keep your sympathetic system going, always looking for the next rush of adrenaline, if you may. And this also hurts your parasympathetic nervous system, reduces your ability to cope, reduces your ability to uh, digest trauma. <laughs> so that is why meditating is so important. And all of the findings around meditation are actually rather new. They started in the year 2000 when the Dalai Lama was invited to a psychiatry conference. And so they actually invited the Dalai Lama just for a photo op. Remember, oh, here we have brought the Dalai Lama. They never expected that he would ask them a question that would change neurology and neurosciences forever. The Dalai Lama said, I see that you know a lot about pathology and what's wrong with the brain. But have you studied the healthy brain? Do you know what makes a brain healthy? And nobody could answer him. So he posed a challenge. I invite you to 
investigate uh, or do some research on the brains of meditators so that you can understand how a healthy brain would function. And that created a whole revolution in neurosciences that now we are seeing. Thanks to this challenge of the Dalai Lama, we learn about neurogenesis. What is that? Remember I talked about neurological connections and how when you get a neurological connection, you go from A to B like this, and, and it's very difficult to change your the way you behave because the connections are set. Well, thanks to the study of meditators, we now know that those connections can be changed through the use of our attention. The attention is like a scalpel that can help you reshape your neurological connections for the better. So that concept is called neuroplasticity. It's something that is um, obtained through me a meditative practice. And you only need to meditate 12 minutes a day for three months for your neurological connections to be reshaped completely. So it's not that demanding. I mean, you, you spend more time on TikTok <laughs> than you would need to spend meditating for you to change your brain. So you help um, the studies of the brain of meditators have also taught us that when you meditate, you make the size of your amygdala shrink. So with a smaller amygdala, it is easier for you to control your impulses, to bring back yourself to, the, to calmness, to, to your own center after you've been put into fight or fright. It's not that we want to lose the fight or flight response because that is necessary for our survival. You who are in an uh, earthquake area, of course you want your brain to be hijacked by your amygdala if you're in danger, if you need to go out of the building very quickly to save your lives. Of course we want the brain to be hijacked, but only under those circumstances. The rest of the time we need to teach our amygdala that it's not always in danger. What meditation does to the brain is that it increases the size of your neocortex and it, it makes you be more in control of your amygdala so it doesn't hijack the brain so frequently. So that was the concept of neuroplasticity. And also by the study of neurosciences and the brains of meditators, we learned that there is something that's called neurogenesis. When I was little, people would tell me, if you smoke marijuana, if you do drugs, your neurons are going to die and you lose them forever. And that is not true. New neurons can be created when you meditate. When the brain is exposed to um, things that make it curious, when you have practices to calm yourself down, when you're in contact with nature, when you have healthy eating habits, there are many ways in which neurons can be created. So this practice that we're going to do helps with neuroplasticity, with neurogenesis, with activating the parasympathetic nervous system, bringing your brain to that laval state in which memories can be transformed in a healthy way. So that's what we will be doing now. Questions? All right, so I'll start sharing the exercise now. If I find it, <laughs> one second. Mm, just one second. Here it is. So it's only 12 minutes long. If you fall asleep, that's okay. You can turn off your camera so we don't notice. Self-compassion for disaster responders. Can you hear it? Can you hear the audio? Yes, we can hear. Thank you so much. Okay. You yes. can do this with your eyes open or with your eyes closed. Thank you. In the yes. face Thank of you. a disaster, people who work as responders may need support in handling the experience because even though it is a novel action and one that leaves them with a sense of satisfaction for having been there for others in a time of dire need, it can also be challenging. If this is your case, assume your meditation posture comfortably and safely place this work in the hands of your own inner wisdom. We will begin with a breathing practice in which we will inhale on a count of four, retain the air on a count of four, and exhale on six. So, inhaling, retaining on five, Exhaling on six. Continue on your own for a little while.
go back to your natural breathing. Since what we imagine is a mandate for our physiology, safely imagine the figure of a mentor who is meaningful to you. It could be someone who lovingly cared for you in the past, such as a friend or a grandmother. It could be the icon of your religious faith, such an angel or a Buddha. It could be any symbol of nature, such as a light or a tree. And it could even be the figure of your most beloved pet. See how this loving, wise and powerful being is accompanying you to give you the strength that you need in these moments, bathing you with a pink light of unconditional love that comes from their heart and that makes you feel that at least here and now you are very loved and you are completely safe. This protective figure accompanies you to a sacred place of healing, which may be a place you know or a place you imagine, but regardless, even this refuge is glad that you are coming here to do this healing work. Give yourself a moment to feel how this loving presence and this sacred space begin to calm and soothe you. And so in this safe space, we will follow the steps of the acronym RAIN, R for recognize, A for allow, I for investigating, and N for nurturing. Look inward and ask yourself, what emotion or emotions are you feeling in the midst of this experience? Is it fear? Sadness? Anger? Helplessness? Overwhelm? Anguish? Dullness? Frustration? Exhaustion? Hopelessness? Even if the emotion or emotions you are feeling are not the popular ones, they are a part of you and they are speaking of your own needs for safety, protection, connection, support, inspiration, boundary setting, etc. So say yes to them. Yes to my fear. Yes to my sadness. Yes to my anger. Yes to my frustration, yes, yes, yes to whatever it is that I am already feeling anyway. Give it a resounding yes. And notice how a certain relief arises as you stop fighting with yourself for not wanting to feel something that is actually very understandable given the circumstances. That was the A for allowing. Now let's go to the eye of investigating. Where in your body do you feel this? Is it your head because of all of the overthinking? The throat from not being able to express yourself fully? Is it your heart from all of this suffering? Is it your stomach because of the fear? Or your shoulders and back because you feel like you're carrying the weight of the world? Or is it your hands or feet from all of this doing and acting and walking? Explore with a sense of curiosity and affection what is happening in your body, offering yourself loving kindness and acceptance.
And now for the M of nurturing. With the four fingers of your dominant hand, you're going to tap on your sternum while you listen to the following story. A patient from New York told me that he was just a child when 9-11 happened. When the city was plunged into chaos and he was facing the stark reality that sometimes there are unexpected events that change life forever and he was feeling overwhelmed by the sense of fear and vulnerability, he asked his mom, how do you go on living knowing that things can change all of a sudden? How, mom? And his mom replied, when you watch the news, intentionally bring your gaze to the first responders. They are the reminder that even though there may be pain in the world, there will always be people who are looking for a way to heal it. They may not be able to spare everyone's pain, but their intention alone is a reminder that there is goodness in human beings and in the world, and that as corny as it may sound, love is actually the only force that sustains us. Those words mark me forever and are the light that has always guided my path. You can now stop the tapping. So by recognizing that the work that you have been doing is actually a labor of love, and it is an inspiration for all humankind of how to overcome adversity, it is a symbol of hope for our collective experience. And yes, love is the only force that sustains us. So bring your hand or hands to the area where you felt the emotional experience the strongest. And imagine that from your hands, a loving warmth, a little light is emerging, which is bringing the perfect satisfier for the need behind the emotions. And this light, this warmth, is lovingly healing what needs to be healed, accommodating what needs to be accommodated, changing in you what needs to be changed for your healthy well-being. That's it. Very good. <laughs> Offer yourself the kind compassion that you have done the best you could and that you are grateful towards yourself for your effort. Tell yourself that you wish to alleviate any and all of your suffering in all dimensions of time and space. And now give yourself a hug with your own arms in a gesture of compassion and kindness. And a pleasant sensation arises, or if it was already there, it is becoming stronger. And that is the sign that this healing process has already started and continues automatically for as long as it is necessary without you having to do much about it and without you being able to stop it either. With each inhalation that you take, that's it. Very good. If there's anything else to attend to now, ask your own inner wisdom what color is needed to support this healing process. And that color, the first one that came to mind, imagine that it is covering you completely, providing the additional healing power of chromotherapy. <laughs> and stay here for a moment recharging your own battery with that healing color. Wonderful. Thank your mentor, thank this sacred place, and thank your own universal wisdom for their help and tell them that you leave everything in their hands. Ask them to look after you and your loved ones. And taking in a deep breath, you are reorienting yourself in this space, feeling relief and a renewed hope.
Namaste. Thank you for meditating with Psychotherapy Amor. So, how's everyone doing? All good? All good. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Uh, what we did um, was entering into a mental label state so that we could um, help the neurological connections be reshaped by the use of our imagination. But this is something that obviously has to be repeated. And but the important thing for us now to consider is that not everything about trauma is bad. Uh, when you overcome trauma and adversity, it, it can be very transformational and it can also provide you with a sense of empowerment. Um, am I sharing my screen? No, I'm not. Um, Uh, so what do we need to promote vicarious resilience? Because we've spoken about vicarious trauma quite a lot, but what about resilience, vicarious resilience? Well, we can achieve that by processing an emotion as we did with a RAIN exercise that during the meditation. Write that down. It's important. R for recognizing, A for allowing, I for investigating in the body. The investigating part is very important. You need to pay attention to your body so that you can help your body process whatever is moving there and uh, go into the next stage of whatever needs to come. Uh, and the uh, end for nurturing. Nurturing was the imagination, the imagination exercise that we did. Um, sorry, I was trying to read the chat and I... Uh, <laughs> for those of you who are still working on site uh, it is important that you consider that it would be good for you to come up with a body system what is the body system is that you're working pairs or in, you know, in groups of three just to check up on one another I guess this is something that we do almost without intention but when we do it intentionally it's even more powerful because it's a way in which we can look after each other's back just being able to be there to listen to somebody to give them a pat on the back, can make a world of a difference for the body to feel once again that the body is safe and can continue doing whatever it needs to be done. And uh, psychotherapy is also important, not only because this particular experience, but because as I've told you, trauma is cumulative. So uh, psychotherapy is something that we all need. I believe the only person in the world who doesn't need Psychotherapy is the Dalai Lama because he meditates six hours a day and so he has no time to get in trouble with anyone. <laughs> but for the rest of us, mortal psychotherapy is highly recommended. And fortunately, there are now so many different schools of thoughts that you can find one that suits your needs and goes well with your life philosophy. Other reminders for those first responders, remember that it is not selfish to take breaks. The needs of survivors are not important than your own needs and well-being. And working all the time does not make you give your best contribution. On the contrary, if you're tired, you're not bringing the best you to the table. The other people who can help in the response, it, it's not your responsibility to do everything. And also watch out for the signs of numbing because numbing yourself won't let you see if you might actually be hurting others instead of helping them. So you numbing, yes, it makes you not feel pain, but it also robs you of your joy. So don't let that happen to you. That's, I believe, the most important thing. What you can gain from an experience like the one you are going through is that you can get a first-hand experience of how people can transform their experience. You can develop more realistic and compassionate views of the world you can be more sensitive to prejudice and human suffering. That is to say, your sense of compassion enlarges. And this is something that is very beneficial for your own psychological health and the one of your environment. And you can also get a deeper appreciation of your own life once you realize how precious it is when you have been in touch with human suffering. The exercise that we did emphasize self-compassion, and there is a reason for that. There's a lot of current research that has shown how good it is for your psychological self or, or health to provide self-compassion to yourself. And this is not something that is easy for people because 
so many cultural obstacles for us to offer compassion to ourselves. We're usually very keen to offer compassion to other people who are suffering, but if it's I who are suffering, we were very rigid. Oh, you shouldn't be feeling like that. What are you stupid? Come on, go get on. And that is the most important predictor of mental health problems. Even more, it is even um, more relevant for your well-being than having gone through a PTSD, PTSD experience. Lack of self-compassion is the cause of many health, uh, mental health problems. So watch out for that. And well. This is the end of my presentation. I hope that you found the information useful and uh, I'm ready for your questions if you have any. Well, can I go first, Flor? Uh, yes. First of all. Who are you? Sorry, can hear you. Can hear. Sorry, Zuleha. Uh, hi, thank Zuleha. you so much. Hi. Hi. Hi, colleagues, and hi, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is how to how to cope with numbness. Mm -hmm. so I, um, could you please elaborate a little bit on that? Dissociation, or what we call numbness, is actually a, a coping mechanism. When a situation is too overwhelming, we go into a free state. Remember I spoke about fight or flight? If you put your hand like this, you will have a, a model of your brain. This is your brain stem. This is your reptilian brain, your mammalian brain, and your neocortex. The amygdala lives here in the limbic brain. So when you're faced in, in the face of trouble, and this goes to something that is called the polybagel theory, the first line of response is you go and look for social engagement so that people can help you soothe. Everything's okay, no, no, don't worry, pat on the back, a hug. That is the first line of defense that the body has to cope with um, trauma. If there's no help available, because we human beings are not very good at supporting one another sometimes, then the system goes into the second line of defense, which is fight or flight, the amygdala. And so uh, if, if there's nobody to soothe me, I cannot soothe myself, then I go into a fight or flight. And remember, I told you that it has to do with our child uh, rearing practices. Children cannot self-soothe. They don't have the power. Their nervous system is not ready to do self-soothing. That is the role of the parents. But if parents don't know that they need to self to help their children soothe, and in the country, if they start telling them, I'll give you something to cry, stop crying right now. I'm going to give you a beating so you stop crying. Instead of helping them, self-regulate they mess the self-regulation system of their children and, and so a, this is something that has to be addressed with psychotherapy obviously so the second line of defense is going into fight or flight when you were not able to do self-soothing or nobody around you could help you self-soothe if that doesn't work you go to an even more primitive response one that comes from the reptilian brain, and that is the freeze response. And NAMI has to do with going back to that more primitive response. It is a, an adaptive mechanism when appropriate. For instance, if um, this comes out once again from evolution, when a cat is chasing a mouse, the mouse knows that it, if it faints its death, the cat is not going to eat it because cats know that the, if they eat rotten meat, they're going to get ill. So uh, that's when freeze is actually helpful, that the numbing response, it's helpful to, to pretend you're dead. But it is not adaptive, for instance, when the deer is in the middle of the road and the car comes by and they just freeze in front of the car, that is a non-adaptive response of the freeze response. So all of our responses can be adaptive or non-adaptive. It depends on the context. If you're in the middle of a situation that is very traumatic, it is useful, it is adaptive not to feel anything or, or to numb yourself, to dissociate. It's actually a, a defense mechanism. It becomes problematic if it is your only response. If you are numb when you're talking to your significant other, when you're talking to your children, when you cannot feel compassion or empathy for others, that's when it becomes problematic. And in that case, a therapy is required. If, if it's if you feel dissociated right now because you're in the middle of a very traumatic situation, it's okay. Leave it there. 
But once you go back home and if you're still feeling the same type of numbness, then it is important that you work with a therapist so that you can regain a sense of safety in the world. And it has to be done through re-educating the body, the fascia, and by changing your neurological connections. It's not a process that happens overnight, but the important thing is to remember that you're feeling like that because it's a defense mechanism. So you first need to regain a sense of safety. And once that you feel safe enough, then you your body will start feeling everything once again automatically, but it won't do it if it doesn't feel safe. Does that answer your question? Yes, pretty much. Thank you so much, Flor. <clears throat> and well, I'm around in case you want uh, therapy, <laughs> pro bono therapy. I'm, I'm willing to offer it to all responders who need it right now. Um, it, it's the least we can do in, in this time. Thank you. Trouble. Very generous of you. Thank you so much. Anytime, anytime. Any other questions? Oh, we have a lot of people on the call. I didn't realize there were so many. <laughs> I have a question if there is no other hand. Sure. Uh, I can Where are see. you? Where are you? I am Mige Flor. Amiga, go ahead. <laughs> I'm here. Um this exercise that we made, mm -hmm. the the one with the fingers. Yes. Um it's the first time I heard of it. Mm -hmm. So um, even in the field, is it okay while mm -hmm. let's say I am interpreting for a psychotherapy session let's say i mm -hmm. did it can i just do it at the same time meanwhile yeah. i'm working yeah, yeah. yeah how how long uh, did we hold our fingers like how long is good I, we did two minutes each finger but it, it depends on the situation for instance if you're facing something that is upsetting you a lot that is causing you a lot of fear you can stick to working with the index finger and just hold that finger don't do it more than an hour <laughs> I don't think you would be able to stand it for an hour but any Jin Shin Jiu exercise cannot be done for more than an hour but in, in, in the inside that period you can hold a single position if you want to or you can go through all of the hands as well I will send you a I do have a book in Spanish. I don't have it in English, unfortunately, but so that you can learn the principles of Jin Shin Jiu which I believe it's a, a very powerful type of exercise. And I liked it because as interpreters, we we have our idle hands all the time. So why not use it to do something good, right? <laughs> People who have interpreted with me, they know that I bring my counter and I'm like this all the time. Well, yeah, if you're using your mouth to do some type of work, you can use your fingers to do some, another one. <laughs> sure, you can do it when you're working. Okay. Um, I have another question, but mm -hmm. I want to see first if there is anyone who hasn't uh spoken yet and wants to ask something or the interpreters if they have questions as well they're invited to participate as well everything's okay go ahead Mugi. sure okay so um sorry gabby i thought you were wanted to to ask a question no 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 i was given i was yielding Mugi the floor oh yes i don't have a question all right i'm so interested in the questions and the answers <laughs> So this, um, the last exercise, the rain, mm -hmm. um, well, for example, that one, I mean, I am realizing again and again that uh, recently I'm not very good at exercises where I have to do like vis visualization techniques and all of mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have, I don't know, I just can't. So um, when I can meditate but uh, like when I can scan through my body like using the body I can do it but using just the visualization I'm not good at it mm -hmm. so um, maybe um, not right now but later on mm -hmm. could you also share um, like a brief um, exercise where I can do we can do meditation through body scanning or more like breathing focus like inhalation exhalation mm -hmm. that kind of um, not so long exercises that could be really useful yeah that's what i said in the beginning that not exercises suit everyone because we it has to do with our perceptual filters people who are more visual they're they are 
uh, have an easier time visualizing. People who are more kinesthetic, they work better with body scans. People who are more auditive are people who can follow instructions more easily and don't depend on, on visual signals or, or bodily sensations. So it's up to you. Now, um, what you're referring to is what in, in Eastern traditions is called the Vipassana type of uh, approach, which is all meditation requires for you, first of all, to get an anchor. Because we know when I was little, people would tell me, when you meditate, you have to, to make your mind go blank. But that, that is something that is impossible. Nobody can go blank. And that is just one of the myths of meditation. You go into meditation knowing that you will be distracted. That is why you select an anchor, an anchor which is going to be the place to which you re, uh, return your attention over and over again once you notice that you have become distracted. Now, uh, anchors can be anything. They can be a visual anchor like watching a candle or, or a yantra, it's called. They can be uh, auditory signals, for instance, the, the noises out in the street. You, or, or for instance, a, man, a mantra or chimes or whatever, or they can be kinesthetic anchors like your body. A body scan is a, one exercise in which you're using your body as your anchor. And for people, for instance, in, in the case of people who are feeling dissociated right now, meditation might seem a little bit threatening because you're feeling sensations in your body that might be difficult. And so that's why you don't want to meditate because you don't want to feel bad. <laughs> the thing is that if you don't go through feeling those signals, you cannot let them go. That's the problem. So what you can do, is I actually included a meditation that's called trauma sensitive meditation that helps you select safe anchors. For instance, in your case, you could select the feelings of your hands. That could be your anchor to bring your attention over and over again or your feet, how your feet feel connected to the ground. Very good also for people who are feeling dissociated. Or you could feel, for instance, all of the anchors that are in the extremities, they are very good at, at grounding and they are very safe anchors. The anchors that are difficult are the anchors that are in this part of the body because this is where the difficult emotions are experienced. So you could try doing that. And yes, of course, I, I have some body scans in my channel. I don't have them in English, but I do have some body scans that I can share with you. And I promise that I'll do a body scan in English. So, but the, the, you can find plenty of body scans on YouTube. That's a very popular type of exercise. Any other questions? All right. Well, if there are no further questions, I hope that this information has been useful to all of you. I thank you for your attention and I'm at your service in case you need any additional help. Um, uh, let me just copy the, um, the I did share the, the yin yoga link, mm -hmm. right? Yes. I, I'm going to share the, this meditation uh, link as well. And that's my channel. You can find many resources in English and Spanish now. And well, see you next time. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Flor. Thank you, Flor. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It was Thank great. Thank you very much, Flor. You are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, for allowing Thank this you, Miguel. opportunity for all of us. Thank you. And a big kudos to all the interpreters. Yay. Thank, Thank you. you. Noe, yeah. Pula, 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 Pula. Thank you so much. <laughs> are you going to take a picture? Yeah. Yeah. I forgot. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I, the cat the cat is trying the, to tell you you're not come on the picture you're, you're forgetting the picture you always yes, forget the, the picture cat. could somebody help us with the picture i i think I'm it not... has to be gallery view yeah gallery view. where do you select me? i had a screenshot but i don't know how can i send it <laughs> oh, could you send it to, to music and um, of course yeah all right all right so it's done <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Flor. It was thank wonderful. you for reminding me, Gary. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, bye. everyone. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Muchas gracias, Flor, por todo tu tiempo, por toda la atención. Por, fue, ha sido tan generosa. Muchas gracias. Con mucho cariño. <laughs> Nos, vemos. Nos vemos. Hasta luego. Bye. Chao.